Have you ever read the Bible all the way through? I know a lot of people have. The first time I did, I'm saying this kind of to impress you, uh, was when I was in junior high. And our junior high youth sponsor offered some sort of prize or reward or something for anybody who'd read the Bible all the way through. So um, a good friend of mine and I decided we would read the Bible through. And I, I can remember as a junior high student during the summer sitting in the backyard reading the Bible. I, I can't believe I actually did it. And uh, so we read the Bible all the way through, and as I look back on that experience, <clears throat> excuse me, I realize that I don't think I learned a thing from the Bible from reading it for a year. I don't, I'm pretty sure it didn't help me to grow closer to God. I don't think I lived a better life because of it. I wasn't more informed, I don't think, really. I just read the Bible through. You know, you can read the Bible through in a year if you read three chapters a day and five chapters on Sunday. And my only, my only goal, you know, was to get through, to keep up, to finish it in a year. And so, as a result, I don't think I profited from it at all. <clears throat> and that's one of the fears that I have for, for us as Christians. I think with good intentions, you hear us talk about the need to be reading the Bible on a regular basis. And so I think sometimes we go into it and say, okay, I'm going to read it every day, you know, and you get out your Bible and you read that section or that chapter. And our goal is just to do it faithfully, but we may not be getting anything out of it. It may not be helping us to live more like Jesus. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that we are presenting this teaching series called Zoom Out. One of our hopes is that if we can get a better overview of the Bible, that when you get to that particular part that you're reading, that there'll, there'll be that bigger context already there, a, a broader understanding of how what you are reading that day actually fits into the Word of God and how God then can use it in your life. So if you've been around these last several weeks, you know it's a six-part series in which we have divided the Bible into six sections of very unequal lengths, but each section given an important part of what God has been doing and will continue to do in the history of our world, beginning with creation, then the fall, and God's chosen people, Jesus, the church, and finally, God's new creation. All of those things that we're looking at, and today we're looking at that segment of the New Testament that we've entitled the church. And so we're really beginning by looking at the book of Acts, which begins with, with the time right after Jesus' death and resurrection and sort of how the church came into being. So this morning, we really need to, to tackle you know, the book of Acts and the book of Romans and First and Second Corinthians, and Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians, <laughs> and Colossians and First and Second Thessalonians and First and Second Timothy and Titus, and Philemon and Hebrews and James, <laughs> First and Second Peter and First, Second and Third John, <laughs> and Jude, and then so maybe we ought to get into it right now. Do you think? So the resurrection of Jesus takes place. He's alive. He appears to his followers during those, those next several days and weeks. Jesus ascends and goes back to heaven. Now, at this point, Jesus has done a really, feels like a really risky kind of gutsy thing. I mean, you, you think of what Jesus has done, you know, leaving heaven as God, becoming a human being, living a sinless life among us, you know, dying on the cross for us, his resurrection, all that he has done accomplished something hugely important. The death of Jesus on the cross was sufficient to atone for the sins of the world, but if nobody carried out that message, it became sort of useless, didn't it? And so Jesus lays on the shoulders of these you know, few dozen believers, in a sense, the fate of the world. If the world was to be saved, if people were ever going to come to faith in, in Jesus Christ, it was going to be up to these few men and women to carry out that mission. 
Now, they had a couple things going for them. One was the things to which they were going to be testifying had been things that they had witnessed and experienced in their own lives. They were talking about something they had seen themselves. In fact, Jesus' disciple John at one point you know, says, you know, that which we have seen and heard, that which you know, our, our hands have touched, our eyes have seen, that's what we're declaring to you. And there's something powerful about that, isn't there? I mean, for the, the believers to stand up and say, I can tell you this because I was there. You know? I saw Jesus after his resurrection. I saw him alive. I mean, think how easily that could have been refuted. All they would have to do, to do was say, you know, look, there's, there's the, the tomb in the garden and it is still sealed shut. What if they had said, I mean, there's only one thing they would have had to have done, produce the body. You know, these Christians could get up and, and testify all they wanted to. Somebody brings out the body of Jesus, and it's over. But no one ever did, because the testimony of these eyewitnesses was true and solid. The other thing they had going for them was the empowering of the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that's exactly what happened. So when we get into the book of Acts, which is, you know, the sequel to the Gospels, picks up right after Jesus has gone back to heaven. Now, what we have is the story in the second chapter of Acts of the Holy Spirit coming upon these believers. 120 of them gathered together in Jerusalem, and God pours out his Spirit upon them in a way that people had never experienced the power the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit before. And they burst forth from that upper room in Jerusalem, and they're proclaiming what they have experienced. And 3,000 people become believers that day. Ta-da! The church is born. And we look upon that event, the, that event, which was taking place during a Jewish holiday called Pentecost, as the birth of the church. And so now we have literally in the city of Jerusalem thousands of people who are believing that Jesus was the Son of God, that his death on the cross was for their sins, and that he rose from the dead again. And with the increase and the growth in the church also came persecution. Try to put yourself in the place of some of these Jewish leaders. I mean, with good intentions, they believed that Jesus was saying things that were blasphemy, he was claiming to be God. You know, he said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. He said, I and the Father are one. They couldn't allow that to continue. And so they crucify Jesus. They execute him. And now, when they're just ready to breathe a sigh of relief, now we've got suddenly in Jerusalem a few thousand people who are believing that that same thing is true. And so they begin to persecute the church. These first Christians, the disciples, and the other followers of Jesus are, are trying to make some big steps in following Jesus and being his hands and feet and his heart and his voice. And so right after this experience of Pentecost, Peter and John are going into the temple one day, and there's a, blind, there's a lame beggar there at one of the gates into the temple, a gate called Beautiful, and he's begging for, for money. And so Peter and John come up to him, and he asks them for money. I can just sort of imagine Peter and John saying, should we do it? Should we try it? You know, should, should we see if we could actually heal this man? Has the power of the Holy Spirit in us and our faith in Jesus Christ allowed us to be able to do, in fact, the things that Jesus did? Because that's what he said. He said, you'll be able to do the things that I did and greater things shall you be able to do. So I think, gulp, taking a big gulp of air, Peter says to him, Okay, uh, I don't have gold and silver to give you, but what I have you, I give you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Get up and walk. Now, this is right there in the, in the temple, and all these people are around, and they've known this guy his whole life. He's been lame since he was born. All these people watching, and what if it doesn't work? You know, what if Peter says, okay, get up. Um, in the name of Jesus... Rise up. Um, 
He doesn't have to do that. It says, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man gets up and walks. How frustrating for these Jewish leaders who think that it's over. And now they're seeing the, the heresy of Jesus being multiplied, believer after believer. And so the opposition continues as the church continues to grow. By now, there are thousands of believers in Jerusalem. They need to kind of get organized. They need to help each other. So the disciples who are there uh, realize there's more than they can do. They just, they just need to be sharing the gospel and preaching and teaching, talking about Jesus. And so they choose seven men, spirit-filled men, to take up the work, and they called them deacons, which means servant, to serve people, to make sure that the widows and the orphans and the poor are being cared for and their needs are being met. And the Christians are loving each other so much that they're willing to share what they have and people are selling their possessions and, and giving it to the church to give to the poor. And there's, a, there's a, a character of the church being established so that when people looked at it, they said, look at that. See how much they love each other. But the opposition continues. One of those seven deacons is, is executed by a mob who are angry at the things he's saying about Jesus. James, one of the 12 disciples. Remember, there's Simon Peter and Andrew and James and John, these two brothers sets of fishermen up in Galilee that Jesus is called. That James, one of those disciples you know, is executed by Herod. And Herod sees that the people are in favor of this. The Jews are glad to see these Christians getting their punishment. And so the opposition and the persecution continues. Jesus has said that's how it was going to be. He had warned them. Let me read you how he put it in Luke chapter 2, excuse me, chapter 21. It says, this is Jesus speaking. He says, before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. And they will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison and you will be brought before kings and governors and all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. Jesus has said, you're going to be persecuted. You'll be arrested and tried and executed. And all of those things are coming to pass. But God used it for good. And so there's a little verse at the beginning of chapter, chapter 8 of the book of, of Acts. And it says this. So it's talking about the day that Stephen, this deacon, is killed, is stoned by this angry mob. And it says, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So we've got all these Christians gathered in Jerusalem. And now the, the persecution becomes so intense that Christians are having to leave Jerusalem. And they're heading out all over Israel, Judea and Samaria. In fact, they're going beyond that. They're going all over that, that, west, that eastern end of the Mediterranean, what we would call Asia Minor, up into the areas of, of uh, getting right into Europe and down into northern Africa. They're going primarily to the places where there were already Jews, where there were Jewish settlements there, and they're taking with them their faith in Jesus Christ. It's called the diaspora. It's that scattering of the church. And God used that persecution to get the Christians out of Jerusalem to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, maybe what we need to do at, at this point is to make sure we understand what we mean when we're talking about the church. Because that's a word that we use in a lot of different ways. So if, we, if, you, if you said to me, hey, I'll meet you at church Thursday night, what does church mean there? It means the church building, Right? So we use that word to describe the church building. We'd probably be better off saying building, right? So it's, it's not the grand opening of the church in Grundy Center. It's the grand opening of the church building. Or what if somebody says to you, so, uh, so what church do you belong to? And you say Orchard Hill. What do they mean there? Not the building. They're talking about a, a local congregation, so sometimes when we talk about the church, we need a building. Sometimes we mean a congregation, a local group of believers. We probably would be better off using the word congregation. But what we're talking about here in this big section of, of God's work in the world, when we talk about the church, we're talking about the body of Christ. We're talking about all believers and followers of Jesus at all times and all places who are called to follow him to be his body in the world. And so when these Christians are scattered from Jerusalem, the church, 
the body of Jesus Christ is spread to areas where it had never been before. Now, at that point, maybe the most important event in the history of the church takes place. There is a young man who is a, a Pharisee, and he, he hates Christians. He believes that it's heretical, the things they're saying about Jesus. And he's been commissioned by the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem to go to other cities and to, to find Christians, to arrest them, to bring them to, to Jerusalem for trial and probable execution. And on his way to, to Syria, he meets Jesus. Let me just say, by the way, this is sort of an aside, you know, these, these biblical cities and areas that we talk about on Sundays are on the news all the time. When you hear them talking about Syria or Damascus, you know, these are the very cities that we're talking about in the book of Acts. Because the, the story, the history that's recorded in the book of Acts is true history. It took place at real times, at real places that are still important in the world today. This young man meets Jesus. His name is Saul. His name is changed to Paul. And he brings to his new faith in Jesus Christ the same zeal and excitement that he had had when he was persecuting the church. This young man then becomes one of the most important men in the history of the church. He becomes a believer in Jesus. He goes to Arabia for several years where he just spends time studying the Bible, praying, going deeper with God. He goes to Jerusalem to meet with the disciples who were there to get their blessing and their commissioning. And then he sets out on three missionary trips going to places where there are Christians to encourage those local congregations or going to places where there maybe is a Jewish settlement but no Christians there to actually found a congregation there, to establish a church there. He's making these three trips and really all of the rest of the book of Acts is the account of these three missionary trips that are made by, John, by, uh, by Paul. It's an amazing story of God, how God used him to establish Christianity. Now, the rest of the New Testament, all of those other books that I mentioned, are really letters that were written by, Jewish, by Christian leaders to some of these new Christian congregations, some that had been started by Paul, others founded by other people. So the, the whole rest of the New Testament, other than the book of Revelation, are letters. We call them epistles. The Greek word is, is like that. That means letters. And so the rest of the New Testament, then, are letters that people like Paul were sending to these new first century Christians to, to help them understand the faith, to encourage them, to give them instruction about how they're to be living their lives. And so when you're reading in the New Testament, and let's say you're going to start reading a book of like Galatians, for instance, one of the first things you need to do is you need to figure out who wrote that letter and to whom is it written. And most of the letters tell right at the beginning the facts about that. So sometimes the, the letter, this New Testament book, will be called by the name of the person who wrote it. Sometimes it will be called by the name of the person who's receiving the letter. So let me give you a little quiz. So like 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, right, the end of the New Testament, was that written, those, were those written by John or to John? Which? That's right, they were written by John. How about 1st and 2nd Peter, written by Peter or to Peter? By Peter, that's right. 1st and 2nd Timothy, written by Timothy or to Timothy? Yeah, they were written to Timothy by Paul. So one of the important things you need to do is you, as you get into reading in the New Testament is to remember to figure out who wrote that letter and to whom was it addressed. You with me now? All of this takes place during the first century A.D. During those next, like, 50 years after the resurrection of Jesus, so Jesus is crucified and resurrected about A.D. 33, more or less. During that next 50 or 60 years, these letters are being written, and they're being recognized by Christians in various places as being authoritative. They, uh, 
They have the stamp of approval of the apostles, the disciples. People recognize them as being spirit-inspired and led. And they come to be recognized as you know, the authoritative word of God for the Christian church. Now, there were, there were two issues, really, that the, uh, the church needed to deal with right away. And the first one is this. They needed to be sure they understood who Jesus was And the second thing that they needed to do was they needed to be sure they understood exactly who was a part of the church. I mean, how does a person become a follower of Jesus Christ? What did it take? And so in these couple of minutes we got left, I want want us to look at a a description of that that's given by the Apostle Paul in the letter uh, to the Ephesians. And this is Ephesians chapter 4. Here's what Paul wrote. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So this first question then, who is Jesus? Paul says there is one Lord, one Lord. And the, the, the main heresy that developed right away in the Christian church, the main misunderstanding about Jesus, was that people had no trouble believing that he was God. They had trouble believing that he was human. And so this sort of weird Christian sect grew up called Gnosticism. Then they were teaching that Jesus wasn't really a man. He was more like a, like a spirit or a ghost. You know? And so one of the things that you're going to find talked about in the New Testament is defining who Jesus was, explaining who he was. He was totally God, but he was also totally man. It's a mystery how he could be both, but it's true. The second issue then was who, who can be a part of the church? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? And Paul says, you know, there's, there's one faith. There's one faith. A person is saved. They become a part of the body of Jesus Christ, the church, through faith in Jesus Christ. God says there is a way by which anyone can come to a relationship with Jesus Christ and become a part of the church. But, he says, there is only one way. Everybody is invited to come, but there's only one way by which we can come. The New Testament says there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You get that? There's only one way by which we come into a relationship with God. Only one way in which we become a part of the church, and that's through faith in Jesus Christ. There's one Lord, Jesus Christ, and one faith, which is belief in him and accepting of him as Lord. Now, I bring this up particularly today because... We just looked for a moment ago at how the the early Christians were persecuted because of their belief. I believe that we are living in a time in which Christians are going to be increasingly persecuted for holding to that truth that there is only one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And if you say that Jesus Christ is the only way by which we can come into a relationship with God, if you say there are not all religions that are equal, that we all worship the same God, that all religions are reaching out to God, taking a different path, but all ending up in the same place. If you deny those things, it's very likely that you will be considered um, bigoted and judgmental and critical and be persecuted for taking that stand. Now, notice in this passage, Paul says, be completely humble and gentle be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to, attain, to keep the unity of the Spirit. Paul says we need to be gracious, we need to be humble, but we need to hold on to that truth. Unity comes in the Spirit, he says. And a person receives the Spirit of God when they become a follower of Jesus Christ. We dare not sacrifice truth for the sake of inclusivity. We try very hard at Orchard Hill to be a church that welcomes everybody into our fellowship, you know, to come, to worship, to serve with us. But being a part of a congregation 
doesn't mean you're a part of the church. Being in a church building every Sunday and maybe every Wednesday doesn't mean that you are part of the church. We become a part of the church through one faith in Jesus Christ, through one Lord, through baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So my prayer is that we would be confident and sure and steadfast in the truth, that we would present the truth humbly and graciously and lovingly, but steadfastly, and that we would not be willing to sacrifice it on the altar of, of societal norms. Let's pray. Our Lord God, thank you that not only did you inspire the writing of this book, the Bible, but that you saw to it that it would be preserved so that those of us who live 2,000 years after Jesus would have this incredible record of how you have been working throughout history in our world, and that we would understand more clearly then how you are working in the world today. Lord, thank you that you died to establish the church, to call to yourself men and women and boys and girls you know, from all places and all times to be followers of Jesus Christ, to let him be Lord and Savior in their lives, to receive the forgiveness that comes only through his death on the cross. Give us uh, confidence and boldness at the same time that you give us compassion and love. It's in the name of this one Lord Jesus Christ that we pray and worship. Amen.